from VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship. This is episode 12 of Circle of Willis, where I chat with social neuroscientist Jay Van Bavel about the effect of moralizing language on political debates, how scientists, or really how we all, use social media to settle disputes, and how a kid from the sticks of northern Alberta manages to become a renowned social scientist at New York University. Hey everyone, it's Jim Cohn. Yep, this is still my podcast, Circle of Willis. I got Jay Van Bavel on the show. Jay is an assistant professor of psychology and neural science at New York University and an affiliate scholar at the Stern School of Business in their, uh, their management and organizations program. Jay's work on group identity, social motivation, moral values, and political beliefs have rocketed him to the national and even international spotlight as one of social science's most influential young scholars. More and more, Jay's work and perspective has seen him working with and for such popular outlets as Scientific American and the New York Times. So he's also something of a public intellectual, which is, I think, kind of a, kind of a tough trick for a scientist to pull off. Anyway, I didn't really know Jay that well before our conversation. We'd never met before in person, uh, though we'd had a fair amount of interaction on social media. And, and social media is, in fact, a large part of what we talk about here. That and the effect of moralizing language on political debates. Spoiler, moralizing language and social media interact in important ways. So pay attention to that. But we also talk a bit about Jay's personal story, his journey from first-generation college student from northern Alberta, that's in Canada, folks, to the hustle and bustle of Manhattan. It's a good story. It's a Canadian story. And Canadian stories always cheer me up. That's partly because I have a lot of Canadian roots of my own, but it's also because, well, because Canada is a little bit funny to me just about all the time. I'm not... I don't, I don't necessarily want to deconstruct why that is, but it must have something to do with hockey and moose, mooses, meese. I'm not, all right, I'm momentarily blanking on the plural form of moose and I'm feeling too pressed for time to stop and look it up. Moose? I think it's just moose for both the plural and singular, but, uh, but whatever. See what I mean? Canada's kind of funny. Anyway, whatever your tastes in intellectual stimulation or scientific biography, this conversation delivers. So I'm going to stop rambling now and uh, just let you hear from the man himself. Ready? Here's Jay Van Babel. So uh, how are things going? Good. Yeah? What are you guys working on these days? What are, what's the, the sort of latest stuff? What's the... What's the hot off the presses kind of thing? Okay, I'll tell you something that we just resubmitted. Okay. I'm excited about. We analyzed Twitter data. Yeah. And it's my first ever big data project. Oh, yeah. And we were looking at whether moral language is more likely to go viral. Moral um, language? What's yeah. moral language? So, like, uh, we used databases that exist of different moral words. So, like, um, the word hate. Words. Like hate is a moral word? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's moralized. Because it's a moral judgment. It's moralized. Yeah. So it, it's morally negative. Um, I see. Virtue would be a po morally positive word. Okay. And it turns out, uh, in particular, moral emotions, if you have them in your tweets, this is a bit of advice for you, Jim. <laughs> you get back on Twitter. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Every moral uh, emotional Twitter word you have world. increases uh, the probability that get your message will get retweeted by about 20%. 20%? Yeah. That's a bad That's a bad thing. Don't you think that's a bad <laughs> well, thing? So here's why it's bad. Um, yeah, tell, tell us why it's bad. Okay, the reason why it's bad is part of the paper is that what ends up happening is if you plot, we, we have this way of inferring people's political belief system based on who they follow and who follows them, uh -huh. developed by political scientists. And if you plot 
all the retweet networks, there's two giant clusters, and it turns out it's liberals and conservatives. And if you tweet moral language, it only gets shared within your ideological cluster. So it gets retweeted a bunch yeah, it, within your group. Yeah, so you have like an echo chamber effect, really, which is liberals. The moment you start using moral language, it only gets shared by people who are like-minded. The problem is that then that creates like group cohesion and clustering and polarization. If you don't use moral language, it's just as likely to get shared by people from the left and from the right. And so, but it won't be get it won't get shared as much. It won't get shared as much. Yeah. So it's a trade off. Oh, Jesus. if you want something to go viral, is. you got to talk to your in group. I mean, these were, in fairness, uh, political topics like same sex marriage, climate change, gun control, which so. you know. These things come up on Twitter. Yeah, right? occasionally. I was thinking about the replication crisis being a case where I bet if we plotted the moralized language there, you might end up with two clusters as well. Yeah, we were talking about this last night. That whole <laughs> the, the whole infusion of moralized language into that yeah. whole debate drives me up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it means that it you... Does... Moral language, there's research on this that came out recently that it starts... It's a, it's a signal. It's a signal to you're using moral language on a topic. It's a signal that you're a good group member. That you're um, a good group member. But what it does is it can actually lead people with the intent of signaling they're a good group member, can actually make them take more extreme stances than they actually believe in. Right. <laughs> so that's, it, I mean, I don't even know if that's, if we characterize that from the perspective of the group itself as a trade off, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, because you're whipping up the group into, yeah. uh, in groupness, groupishness. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I love the word whip. I mean, that makes it like that's what you call <laughs> yeah, the person right. for a political party who lines everybody up. Right. For a vote, yeah. right? How it's like that? they go around twisting arms and uh, bending people behind the scenes yeah. and making sure they follow Using the party line. language. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Or we will uh, make sure that you don't get reelected in your district. Do you think that the risk there is that by sort of whipping up your group into in, in, getting your, your in-group in line, yeah. that that very process can put your group at risk for being less influential out in competing with other groups. Potentially, if people start to react against you because they feel like you're pushing forth a group interest, yeah. or if they see you as an outgroup, they might react against what you're saying, even if it's a legitimately reasonable claim. Right. You see that in politics all the time. Yeah. It's that I think Obama's Healthcare Act is a good example of that. It was actually an idea from a right-wing think tank. Yeah. But the moment it was coming from Obama, people, Republicans, uh, reacted negatively right. against it. And right. so right. 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 that... He was hoping, I think, that he took some ideas from the right, they might yeah. actually be receptive and get on board. And you can imagine that playing out in negative ways scientifically, too. If right. I have a, an agenda item that I think is really compelling, but if you see me as an outgroup member, you react against it because maybe you distrust me or a way of singling to other group members your your loyalty. Yeah. And that means it might be hard to broker a compromise. Right. right. It seems to me that that's, I mean, I sort of can understand that in the context of political battles because mm-hmm. politics has always sort of been that way in yeah. some ways. Although, you know, the, the, the whole James Madison project in, mm-hmm. in constructing the way that the American government works is to constrain that, mm-hmm. to like keep that from being effective, those yeah. kinds of emotional appeals. Right. Yeah. But one of the things that I wonder about is how it's playing out in scientific communication these days. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm doing this, you know, talking with people while the recorder's on is because it seems like, and I don't know whether this is really true or not, but it just seems to me from my own experience that the social media environment somehow encourages the moralistic language, or at least mm-hmm. if it's not specifically moralistic, it's language that whips people into yeah. line, right? Yeah. That, that creates this very groupish kind of... Is, do you think there's something to that? Do you think that's... Yeah. Really true? I think that there's multiple elements to it. One is Twitter and other social media platforms have a trolling problem. This extends well beyond science, where when people are behind an icon and it's a bit more anonymized, or at least you're not sitting across a table face-to-face like you would at a conference, you're much more likely to be provocative, to challenge somebody, um, maybe to say something more egregious or offensive than you otherwise would. So we know that that's... Now, science is using those technological tools and it's not surprising as humans we run into some of the same problems <laughs> right right so right, that's right. not but it but it now infuses itself in scientific dialogue um the other thing i think is that as i was just saying people probably have a pretty good intuition that certain types of language makes their content go viral 
And so think of the reward contingencies on the social media. Yeah. It's retweets, likes, yeah, yeah, yeah. shares, exactly. right. Facebook, Facebook, it's like our Skinner. blog views. It's like the ghost of Skinner coming yeah. in. And, and, and you're getting these little hits. Yeah. Every time you right. like open your phone or you have these applications yeah. open, I get them too. And it's like... You I've know, turned off all notifications because otherwise I go crazy. Yeah, like, it's like you get a little beep or yeah. jiggle even in your pocket yeah. or something oh, like God. that. Help and it means all. like rewards are coming in. And so I think that there is an incentive structure to using the type of language that actually erodes the debate. It, yeah. And it's also like we know this like with BuzzFeed and these types of places use like all these little hooks and strategies to catch your interest and oftentimes they're subtly deceptive to get you to click the link so they get advertising dollars. Right. Scientists are susceptible to the same things. They might not have advertising dollars coming in for their blog, but they're checking how many blog hits they've got. Sure. Um, and they're of getting course, a yeah. sense of what works I and what do. doesn't work. I, it yeah. drives me crazy. My, yeah. my, my one stupid blog post I ever wrote <laughs> is already like easily the most widely read thing yeah. <laughs> I've, I've ever put out there. Uh, either that or I'm crazy. I mean, I, I get these stats. Yeah. You know, it's it, all the time. It just keeps coming in. You How know? many times has it been read? I'm totally curious. Um, something like 17,000 times. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, the next most read thing I've ever written can't be more than 500. <laughs> <laughs> so you have like an order of magnitude, yeah. more influence. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, you know, as, as a scientist, you know, we all... Uh, are trained to try to get people to see our work, to hear our ideas, mm -hmm. right? And the typical medium, going through all the bullshit of peer review yeah. and the aggravation of reviewer three yeah. or whatever, it's, it just it takes a year to get your precious thing out yeah. and then nobody reads it. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, Jesus, it's so punishing. And so now yeah. we've got blogging and Facebook and Twitter, and we can just like, put the thing out there and immediately yeah. get this feedback that people yeah. are looking at it or getting impressions or whatever the yeah. hell it is. I don't understand half the, the, the metrics. I think the other thing you've touched on that's interesting as well is the reward structure is immediate versus long term. Yeah. And we know that humans are pretty terrible at delayed gratification yes. um, and temporal discounting. I can't speak for anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's almost like the type of feedback we get, not only is it quantifiable, um, and it's orders of magnitude greater in terms of impact, the number of people who will read your writing, but it's immediate. Yeah. And so you have almost like if you could engineer something that triggers like all these kind of primitive cues in the human brain, right. that's and the social feedback too. It's right. social reward, which we know is like like worse than cocaine for us in a lot yeah. of ways, right? Yeah. Like belongingness is yeah. pretty a fundamental human need. It triggers all the Absolutely. primitive reward sure. systems. Yeah. To to have people around us who are part of our tribe. Yeah. Or yeah. 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 Well, so it makes me wonder a little bit whether social media, I'm going to say something kind of provocative here, but okay. I, mean, I don't know, it, whether social media is sort of like one of the new problems for scientific yeah. discourse. Now, a lot yeah. of people people that we know, they, they think that social media is like the future yeah. of scientific discourse. And that it's precisely because yeah. of its immediate feedback that it's so useful. So I wonder so, about that. So let's play with that. I mean, it sure has worked yeah. out well in politics, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think that social media is good and bad. Okay. I mean, I don't see it as a net, I, I must see it as a net positive if you judge my behavior. Well, because I'm on Twitter, I wouldn't way too say much. that about. I'm me too, <laughs> and I don't think that's uh, that's a verdict in yeah. favor of of those media. Okay, I think true. That's, it's that's maybe a verdict of my own sort of personal weaknesses, right? Yeah. So, so I have a colleague over at the business school here, Adam Alter, who last week or so just came out with a book called Irresistible, which is about right. how, how technologies it. exist are uh, I bought it. Adam addictive. Alter. Yeah, Adam. So I'll give Adam a plug. Yeah. And we are humans, scientists are humans. That's something we often forget, right? Yeah. We act like we're objective, impartial right. um, observers of nature. And the fact is that we're human. So we have the same sensitivities and um, weaknesses that other humans have. And right. so it's easy to get drawn into these types of issues. And we should be mindful of human nature when we're trying to like create systems and technology that are going to help science. Right, right. I tell my students yeah. that... The way that scientists disseminate information, most of them, is uh, woefully outdated. It was stuff it was like these ideas of going to a conference, paying two thousand dollars for your flight, your registration, your membership, your hotel for four days, your food. Yeah. 
um, your poster printing costs. Yeah. To go is. stand in front of a poster. And I've had posters where two people have come by. Yeah. My best poster of all time had about 50 people come by. And, oh, wow. Man, I was living large that day. It was like right during the lunch session. And <laughs> this is at like SPSP. SPSP, yeah. But it takes like yeah, well. a day or two to put a poster together and, you know, four days to go I know. set it up. Or you could write a blog post of that exact same project. You can actually get multiple people to edit it the same way. And it goes online and it's more public people who can afford to go to the conference or are interested in that topic but don't normally go to that conference can see it. They can give you right. comments. You can have a right. better dialogue. So from that perspective, it's way more efficient economically. Sure. No question. No yeah. question it's more efficient economically. I mean, the investment that you have to put in as yeah. you laid out plain, you know, comparing yeah. the making a poster and going to a conference versus writing up something and putting it online. Even if you do have multiple editors, the yeah. investment is the difference is huge. Yeah. What a net savings. Yeah. I do wonder what the trade off actually is, though. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I don't think yeah. I don't think that people are interacting. I don't want to overstate this too much, but the kind of the way that we're sort of shaped by natural selection to behave yeah. with each other. There's another thing about about blogs and social media and things like that that I think I see in my colleagues is that, and that is yeah. the the sort of need to demonstrate our cleverness. Oh right? yeah, you know that we 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 want we all want to be like a little H. L. Mencken or Mark Twain or something <laughs> yeah. when we're when we're writing a, about somebody's silly stats conclusion or something. <laughs> you know, we, we have to, we have to not just say what we think. We have to yeah. say it in a very clever thing, way yeah. because we're using written English or whatever. But you, we don't, you don't worry about that so much when you're sitting around talking with somebody yeah. you know, at a conference. I think th it's multiple things. One is that you conform to the norms of the medium of communication that you're using. Mm. And so well put. when yeah. I'm writing an article for a scientific journal, I take all of that stuff out. Even if it starts with something interesting, it ends up becoming a rather very a rather boring document, right? Yeah. Um, or one of my colleagues would be like, "I'm uncomfortable, you know, making that quip." Or, <laughs> At best, you're allowed to put it in the footnote. Right. Um, right. Right. Of course, it's much more fun to read your colleagues when they actually have a little bit of life in their writing. Yeah. But with blogs, it's we write in a way that's normal for blogs, and so we're reading blogs online all the time that are outside academia, and there's a different nor set of norms about how to right. communicate. And we conform our thinking and our expressions to that medium. And it's more sort of hip. It's and more funny and yeah. yeah, informal. And I love, I have to say, like, they're more fun to read. Uh, completely. <laughs> I know. Yeah. They are. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not disputing any of that. But I wonder if that's part of the problem, too. I yeah. mean, look, I, I don't really feel strongly about any of these positions. Yeah. I really don't. But I sort of feel like for some reason, voicing them this morning. Okay, so let me play this out. So I've been yeah. the advocate for blogs and yeah. social media. So let me push back on my own arguments. So here's <laughs> some of the trade-offs. One of the trade-offs, I think, is that for very junior people, I actually think that blogs could be more harmful than helpful for multiple reasons. Um, sure, it can get their name out, but their papers are ca very carefully curated. By yeah. their advisors, right. reviewers, editors, their their lab members, friends, colleagues, their blog thoughts, but almost by definition, are not curated. And so they're throwing something out there. And from a faculty member who's been in the field for five years or ten years, um, they've got uh, pr hopefully enough criticism over the time. They probably know what the landmines are and what yeah. they can claim and can't claim. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Whereas somebody who's new to the field might not realize some of these landmines that are stepping into. And so it's in their best interest to have more curated content. When I think of my ideas and my first drafts of papers that I sent to my advisor in grad school, they came back covered in red ink. Will will vouch <laughs> oh, yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was a terrible writer um, and uh -huh. not the best thinker. And that's why I was doing my PhD, right? And I'm still evolving my thinking all the time. But I will guarantee you the quality of what I would write today in a blog is 10 times better than what I would have written as a third-year graduate student. Sure. And so I, for one, am grateful some of my first initial submissions of papers weren't accepted as yeah. is, yeah, yeah, right. and that they either got thoroughly torn apart and I had to go back to the drawing board or else I had to carefully revise them. Yeah. And so I would not want a public record of my terrible that thinking. Process. I'm really grateful that process. That, that process. a writer. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and also the other thing about blogs, I'll say this, something I do on Twitter. There's an app that deletes all my tweets that are more than six months old. 
There is. There is an app. And so every time I tweet something, six months from now, it would just be automatically deleted. Huh. And the reason for that is because when you're engaging in conversation in social media, it's often in a context. Right. So you're saying something in light of a debate that's happening right now, yeah. which is what makes it fun and, and relevant and engaging. Yeah. But looking back on it in two years, it might, out of context, it might look offensive or inappropriate or at the very minimum be misconstrued or yeah. wrong. And so I actually intentionally have that because the types of comments I make on social media are not curated in the same way my articles are. And they haven't gone through the review process. There's a thought I had in light of some debate that's going on that makes sense to all the people in that debate at that moment. Right. right. Or to you in that moment. Or to me in that moment. And I don't expect it to stand the test of time or to make sense outside of that context. And I've seen this with some people where they've said something and people have gone back through a bunch of their old comments and pulled out stuff that oh, yeah. looked bad I've in retrospect, but maybe at the time didn't seem that bad. Well, so. I mean, this is part of what we're learning about the medium right mm -hmm. over time too is that when twitter's first out when i first start using twitter i'm being really flippant all the time yeah. because it's just doesn't totally. seem serious to me totally it's Same just here. not a serious medium it's yeah. just for bullshitting with with people yeah. who want to bullshit back and there's yeah. no serious content i didn't hold myself to any kind of standard of yeah. seriousness uh when i'm first using it then i went through a phase where i'm like writing clever aphorisms you know <laughs> and, you know and and trying to to impress my colleagues with my yeah. with my sheer cleverness mm -hmm. and that was oh god that's so embarrassing it's horrible i can't even you look to like you're trying it. too hard yeah oh jesus <laughs> and then it's just like posting articles or whatever and yeah and then the debates about the re reproducibility the great Christ, the reproducibility, great reproducibility debate, debate. <laughs> And, uh, and so I guess now I'm sort of back, I've sort of come full circle in a way where I'm not behaving like a jackass as much as I yeah. used to, but I, again, once again, can't take it very seriously. I just can't, I can't do it. I'm as liable now to publish, you know, to post a picture of my dog as I am to, to, <laughs> I think to, it was a video of a about, panda that you yeah, posted this Yeah, video of a panda, morning. right? See the panda rolling downhill was funny and I wanted to show that to somebody i don't even know who's following me but they're gonna see a panda now that's, that's what i saw happen. when i woke up this morning yeah, Jim. See? thanks for that you got it that's what twitter is now it's eventually just again. gonna come full circle to bieber comments and yeah. cat videos and i think that does suggest something about the medium mm -hmm. i mean it really does you know that's kind of what you can do with that kind of medium it's not about serious conversations mm -hmm. it just can't be or at least I mean, I think that some people can do it. I can't figure it out. It's yeah. exhausting to me to use yeah. that medium. It's chopped up. You know, I have to read people's like one slash oh. two slash so, so that they can complete an actual thought. Yeah. You know, <laughs> in, with, in, 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 in Twitter tweets. and 10 tweets. <laughs> um, Forget it. So, so one way I like Twitter is saying something, but then linking to some longer article or story you've read or... Uh, magazine piece. Yeah, linking to articles yeah. is, is useful. And I have learned about really great research that way. Yeah. And I so love I it. like it for that. And I have a curated list of people who are interesting and I yeah. follow and I learn about things way outside my normal scope because they're good curators. Yeah. What it's terrible for that I agree with is debate because you can't provide context or qualification. Right. The type of things that are normally part of the scientific dialogue yeah. is I acknowledge three points, but I'm making a fourth point over here. Yep. And then yep. you're like, okay, you've acknowledged my three points. Let's debate the, let's drill down on that fourth. Right, right. But if I have to get immediately to my criticism of you and I can't affirm the, the shared ground, we end up shouting past one another and we both get frustrated. It up escalates. And so I've really decided that the format of Twitter is terrible for debate of almost any kind, but especially scientific debate. Yeah, I agree. Which is often very complex. Yeah. So, um, but I, I, I think it has other value, but I agree um, 100% with that. So then the question is, what what is the best venue for, yeah. for that kind of debate? I haven't, I haven't enjoyed Facebook either. I've left all yeah. of the various <laughs> iterations and versions of PsychMap, including the PsychMap plus, 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 plus. Oh, man. How plus. could you leave PsychMap plus, plus, plus? Actually, I don't think I left plus. that one. <laughs> I didn't the, leave oh, that that's one. That's my favorite one. That's man. my favorite one, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one that, that I can take seriously. 
<laughs> it's a parody uh, Facebook group for right, anybody who's listening. Right, right. <laughs> I've left all those groups too. Because, yeah. well, go ahead. Why, well, why I did was, you leave them? I was going to say, I thought they were. I thought Facebook is a better place for dialogue and discussion I, I did too. than Twitter. It is better. I, I, yeah, it I think is. there's no right. question. Because yeah, it's richer. Right. Yeah. You, can, you can make more of it. You argument. can make a paragraph point. But even there, it what, what is it? Um, the, the claim that every argument on the internet eventually boils down to somebody else calling somebody Hitler. Hitler, right. Yeah. yeah. And now it's really Trump. You, yeah, right. Any argument you follow long enough. And, yeah. and it was... People, someone on there is having a serious discussion. I thought about some scientific practice, and they started referring to me as George Bush. Um, now I'm sure they would <laughs> have called me Donald Trump. Did they, yeah. did they know that you're painting portraits now? <laughs> yeah, Bush has gone up in the public veterans. opinion. Yeah, so right. Yeah. I think maybe it was a comp- backhanded compliment. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, good. So, but even, and then I was like, I'm spending time reading paragraphs. Yeah. And some people are just really thoughtful. They'll write a re- really thoughtful set of comments. Yeah. Uh, on some issue, and I was trying to do that too. Yeah. Um, I, I certainly emulate that approach for a scientific dialogue, and then I realized like how much time it was sucking from writing the things it I actually cared really about. Sucks a lot of time, and yeah. and it's not clear why I'm doing it, mm-hmm. other than I get caught in the stream. Right? Yes, you know, it's like it just sucks me in, and yeah. then I have suddenly something to say. But I didn't give a shit about it like five <laughs> minutes before. Yeah, and I have all this totally. other stuff to do. So I yeah. look at it and suddenly I'm forced to give a shit about a thing and then yeah. respond to it. Not forced, but... And I have personal failings too. I mean, I yeah. have personal... Pro- like I get angry. <laughs> like it's really hard for me not to get angry when I read stuff in print. But I hardly ever get angry when I'm face to face with somebody. Yeah, same. So I don't understand what accounts for the difference. There was this great video... I forget what it was. It's from one of the late night TV shows, maybe the late show or something. And Robinson Cano, who is an all star player for the New York Yankees, yeah. he was a free agent and he signed with Seattle. And he was coming back to New York for his first game. And so they set up this picture of him somewhere in like Manhattan on the street. And they brought like people off the street and they said, Are you a Yankees fan? And um, people came off the street and they said, Are you going to come to the Yankees game tonight or this weekend? And they're like, Yeah, I'm going to come. They're like, There's a picture of Robinson Cano. It's his first time back. How do you feel about him? They're like, Oh, I hate that guy. Such a (laughs) traitor. And they said, Now's your chance to boo, boo him. You know, show him how much, how displeased you are that he left and he sold out. And they boo this this giant picture of Robinson Cano's head. And then Robinson Cano is hiding behind this picture. And he comes around and they realize they're booing at the real person. Oh my God. That's they're face to face like we are. And then all of a sudden they're like, Hey, man, how's it going? They give him a high five. They shake his hand. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, sorry about that. I was just playing. And yeah. it's like, we, we are really good at humans at like booing something that's a step removed that's from the That's a representation. Person. Yeah. Right? But the moment we're interacting and we see, this is like a very primitive part of human nature too. It's like, you're looking in their eye, their flesh and blood. You can see their emotional response. It's very hard for us yeah. to be mean to a person face to face. I wonder about that in terms of, you know, sort of what do representations of a person afford so there's a good, um, there's this movie, I forget what it's called, but um, it had maybe Keanu Reeves and parts of the scene were vertical, so like a real movie. Yeah. And then they had parts of the movie that were filmed where they, I think it was Waking Life or something like that. Oh, right. And they looked cartoonish. Yeah. And so it was the actors, but they had some veneer that made them look like a cartoon. Yeah. And so they cut back and forth. And so someone did, uh, Raymond Marr did this study in the scanner with the vertical scenes from the movie versus the cartoon scenes from the uh-huh. movie of the same characters. Interesting. It looks just like Keanu Reeves, a real versus cartoon version. Right. And um, what happens, as you might predict, is all these regions of the brain involved in social cognition are just much more strongly active when you're seeing the real version of him. Yeah. Even though all the other stimuli are pretty carefully controlled. The voice is the same. The, the type of actions are the same. But the more real somebody is to you, it triggers these basic social cognitive systems in a much stronger way. So I wonder if that suggests a couple of things, right? If we're going to be using these these media, we have to know this, mm-hmm. the, 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 that there's this tendency and sort of come up with some, some maybe some principles yeah. for how, how to approach communication through those media. Mm-hmm. The other thing is we don't use those media for, yeah. for some of these purposes. Yeah. You know, I have, I have colleagues, Dan Willingham, who basically is like, yeah, I'm not going to debate with anybody on, on Facebook or Twitter. I'm going to yeah. post my you know, pictures yeah. of my kids to my friends and, and talk about birthday cakes and things. Yeah. So, so I kind of do a hybrid. I decided I'm not going to debate people, 
but I read what they post. So I'll go yeah. read the blog post. I'll read the link to an article if it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I really mm-hmm. appreciate that. It's super useful. And I, as much as I don't really blog that much, I read a lot of blogs, uh, the good ones. Yeah. Um, I know who, who has quality writing. And the problem, of course, with blogs is there's no barrier to posting. Yeah. So you have no curation. So eventually you learn by the reputation of the blogger what's going to be good and what's not. Right, sure. Um, but I feel like now I know that landscape. And so I, I, I don't belong to PsychMap, but I'll tune in once a week and scroll through all the posts and see if there's yeah. anything interesting that I need to know. So I appreciate those platforms even as I've removed myself right, from them. Right, yeah. And I think like that's actually made my mental health so much better oh, and made me no more productive. Question. No question. I've been a much happier and more productive person since I stopped yeah. engaging with that stuff. And a better parent. And like better I'm parent, not parent, better husband. Get, yeah, if you're getting comments at 6, 7 p.m. on your phone and yeah. someone's criticizing you publicly. You've got to pay attention. There's a strong desire to manage your reputation, right. to jump in and defend yourself. That's right. And that's a very basic human thing, especially if you think now in these these forums, these discussion groups, 5,000 people are members, and you're thinking the whole field's watching somebody critique me, yeah. and it doesn't seem fair, so or they're wrong, so I have to go on and say why. Yeah. It's very hard to you know feed your kids dinner. Sure. And so by removing myself from those, I feel better. I still get all the information. And I'm a better partner, a better parent, yeah, yeah. a better mentor to my students. I have more time for them because right. I'm less sucked into it. Right. So I feel like all of the people I actually care about benefit from me having boundaries that are healthy. Well, as a scientist, I can still read any of the blogs or articles that are posted. If you want. If yeah. I want to, if, yeah. they're, if they're relevant to what I do. Right. So well, what about the, the yeah. you, you also write a fair amount for the popular audiences. So you've yeah. written for like Scientific American and New York yeah. Times and places like that. How does that fit into this sort of broader ecosystem of yeah. communication? So there's multiple things. And this is part of the reason I'm a defender of public communication on blogs is that I feel like part of what we do as scientists, a lot of it is funded by the government. Yeah. And I feel like we have an obligation to give back to the public. Uh-huh. Uh, I also know that public scientific literacy is remarkably low. So it's easy to think of like a lot of myths about the brain, right? Um, yeah. We use 10% of our brain. Right, there's left right, brain and right. right brain people. That's right. Um, teachers should, there's different learning, learning styles. Learning styles, right. And yeah. so scientifically, so many of these things have been debunked. Yeah. And so if we know something that's going on, we have, I, I think if we do research in that area, we have a responsibility to share those insights with the public. Yeah, sure. Um, there's always a fine line where you start to oversell because there's a, a separate set of reward structures there. Writing in, the, in those media. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I will say part of the reason I like to write in the public, um, I've written about my own work. And part of the reason I do that for the public is I had this really funny experience with the press release. So when I started as a young faculty member, my advisor, Will Cunningham, Will has Cunningham. never done a press release in his life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he just has disdain for that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, which I respect. Will. But I remember um, seeing a bunch of my other colleagues doing it. And it, I remember reading an article saying, like, if you get press coverage of a paper, it increases academic citations right. by 15 or 20 percent. So I thought, oh, this is part of like the dissemination of the yeah. article process. Yeah. I've done so, press releases. Yeah. So I done I did a few as a junior faculty member and I thought they went well. It wasn't like the, pre- the, the press properly represented the work uh-huh. when, it, when it was covered. It didn't get a ton of coverage, but yeah. the, the coverage was good. But then I went to do a press release for one of my students' papers. And um, I, lo- I like our press office people here, but they sent back what they were going to do for the press release to myself and my student. And my stu- I said, look it over, Lior. Let me know what you think. Is yeah. this accurate representation yeah. of our work before we approve this? And he came to my office and he said, they quoted me here, but I never met with the guy. So, like, I didn't, I didn't do an interview, yet I'm quoted as if I did an interview. Wow. And he's like, is That's this normal little... for press releases? And then I looked at the quotes for me, and I wasn't looking carefully at those. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't sound like something I would say. I don't remember what I said for my one-on-one, but I, that doesn't sound like me. Wow. And so I realized what they're doing is they're, they're filling in the blanks, and they're hoping you just approve or you'll edit it. Yeah. And they're trying to enrich it with quotes, even if they haven't spoken to you. But at that point, I decided... That takes it a little far. It, it felt a little too far. So I think in the last five years, I've done one press release. Um, but for the most part now, what I decided I'm more comfortable with is writing an op-ed in like 750 or 1,000 words, which uh-huh. is just a longer abstract. Right. And 
if it's interesting to the public, I'll write it for the public. If it's more for scientists, I might write it for Scientific American. Yeah. Um, and so for some articles, maybe a handful of articles, I've done that. And I like it because and I you can... you just submit them? What? Um, well, you contact an editor contact there. An editor? At first, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who who's who, but... Yeah. Eventually, I learned who the people were at these places. Like, uh-huh. That's how the press office helps me now. They, here's the person to contact there. Perfect. And then you send a few sentences, and they'll tell you if they're interested or not. And then you write it, and there's a lot of back and forth as they have their audience. And yeah, you, yeah, and yeah. And you want to make sure that it's rigorous. And right. I have to say, when I've written those, the best compliment that I can get, because you get crazy emails. I've gotten hate mail and all kinds oh, of crazy I've got, stuff. I've, had, I've been down that road, <laughs> okay. too. We've gotten some press in the past. Yeah. So I've gotten hate mail. If you go to my office door, there's a bunch of like postcards from <laughs> like the Unabomber on my wall, basically, about <laughs> all the stuff he hates of mine. So I wear that like a bit of a badge of honor. But the stuff I really love is I had a senior colleague who said, I read this. I hadn't read your article, but I read this. And I liked it. And another colleague said, I'm going to use this in a class I'm teaching. Yeah, this is great. that's and nice. Another colleague at NIH said, I'm going to create an infographic and use this to educate about implicit bias here. Um, so it's when my colleagues who are scientists see it and they think this is a great distillation of yeah. what we know. One person, a uh, senior colleague at Columbia, emailed me, and he I don't think he's read anything of mine, and he said, you wrote this with a lot of integrity. And what I took that to mean was that it actually kept to the science, but made it accessible. That's a real skill, dude. And so to that's me, hard to pull th- off. That's that's exactly what I try to aim for, Yeah, um, is not stretch the science in any way that's untrue, but make it interesting, connect it to broader issues. Right. And so that's kind of the sweet spot I end up aiming for, Yeah. Uh, because I do know I cringe if I have a colleague and they write something for the New York Times and they just make categorical claims. Yep, yep. And I'm just like, you just can't do well, that. Well, you know, what's really instructive to me about hearing what you're doing is that I realize I've sort of responded to press about my own work kind of helplessly. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just like, ah, I didn't, yeah. you know, I talked to them for a half an hour on the phone and now I am, it's completely out of my control. Yeah. And I think a lot of people feel that way. And that sort of sets up this sort of antagonistic yeah. kind of... And people often feel burned. by yeah. when you talk to my colleagues, they had a bad press write-up of something. They had an interview for half an hour. Right. So they pulled... The, the, the journalist pulls one quote that... Exactly. Out of context, yeah. and they're pissed. Yeah. And that's happened yeah, yeah. to me. So I, I really... If you write the lead piece, you kind of control you the shape message. the message, yeah. That's yeah. really good. So, I think we ought to do more of that. So I really like that. And I feel like... Um, what we do in, in our research area is interesting to human beings. And yeah. I have to say, I would always rather see any scientist I know speaking to the public than I would to see some pundit like Ann Coulter uh, telling right. people about vaccinations yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. So I always feel like any scientist I see, even if they're slightly untethered from the data, almost still always does a better job than whoever's going to fill that space in the newspaper yeah. or on CNN or whatever. Well, and it strikes me that there's one thing that you said about writing something for, say, the, the New York Times yeah. that's different, that's pretty different from, say, writing a blog, yeah. which is the feedback and the editorial process. Yeah, they Sometimes have a lot of oversight. The, the you know, editors, I have to say, helpful. everything I've ever written with editorial site oversight has gotten better. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, I deeply appreciate that. It makes it more clear. They make sure there's quality. They do their own fact checks. Yeah. So they're not perfect. They have different set of standards, but it's better than just me spewing something. Yeah. Um, same with yeah. every journal article I've ever written, guaranteed has gotten better from the review process, from reviewers and editors. I love I, it. No question. Reviewers aren't perfect. Their reviews tend to be uncorrelated with other reviewers. Right. But there's almost always some nugget of gold in every review that you can use. I agree. Yeah. Most of the time. It yeah. works out well. Every once in a while, it doesn't. And then those are the yeah. ones you remember. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But the, but the reviewers are one and, out of and ten editors are, are the better. unsung heroes. Yeah. And that they're doing volunteer work. Exactly. All of them. Yeah. All right. So how'd you get here? What, what are you doing here? <laughs> what in the hell? You're at New York University. You're doing yeah. this great work that's getting all these awards and blah, 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 and, you know, blah, and blah, 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 <laughs> and awards, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and you're writing for the New York Times now and Scientific yeah. American. Yeah. How did you, what, what's the, where do you come from? Uh, so, you know, the backstory here. A little bit. I, I know so, you're from like north of Edmonton. Somewhere, I grew up right? in a small town, Fox Creek, Alberta. Fox Creek, Alberta. In, it was, it was in the I woods. I think you were supposed Alberta. to come from there. Isn't that against the law? Yeah. I think I, I, every time I go home, all my family and friends ask, when are you going to move back? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Why would you want to stay in New York? Why would you want to do that? Yeah. You're from Fox Creek. Yeah. We, we can't get a full hockey team together without you. <laughs> yeah. Our curling team is is dying. Yeah, they need a they need a skip. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a town of two thousand people. Um, Jesus. And it was that gives me there was, anxiety there was no radio that. at the time. There was no radio. There's no radio out there. There's no movie. What theater. happened if you fell and hit your head or something? Um, Would I you mean, just die? There was a little just... hospital in town. Yeah. Okay, but that was uh... if anybody found you. <laughs> yeah, they found you. You'd be okay. <laughs> they just find you with snowdrifts collecting in your glassy eyeballs. I had a friend on my hockey team who had too much to drink and fell asleep in a snowdrift. And we had the <laughs> oh we had the bus ready the next was, morning to I go on a, joking. to a trip on a hockey a hockey game. And we, he didn't show up for the bus. At like seven in the morning, and someone went driving around and found him. He had fallen asleep in a snowbank. He had like hypothermia, and so that's like a joke, but it's a legitimate oh thing, God. man. And we warmed it him up really on the bus. It's really cold up there. Yeah. Oh, it's cold. It's uh, gets to about minus forty. Yeah. Which is I the know. point at which Fahrenheit beats uh, Celsius. <laughs> it's minus forty is the same thing, no matter where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get into Edmond, Edmonton much? Yeah. Edmonton's so, a nice town. So I went to University of Alberta. So I lived uh-huh. in Edmonton for five years. And uh-huh. uh, yeah, I liked Edmonton a lot. So that's where you did undergrad. So I did uh, my undergrad. Yeah, spent a lot of time at uh, West Edmonton Mall. And and what'd your parents do? My parents, uh, my stepdad worked in the oil field, which in is why oil we're in Fox field. Creek. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah, yeah, the oil fields of Alberta. So that was the my famous. S- that's what got me through college, man. Working in really? the oil field in the in you the worked summers. in a, in in the summers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so your dad, what, what, what did he do? Was he like a chemist or something? Or um, he... No, he was the warehouse guy. He was the warehouse guy? Yeah. What does M- that mean? What did um, he, do? he would order in supplies and uh-huh. chemicals and stuff. Like a foreman or something? Or Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a manager. Yeah. Yeah. And my mom worked for uh, Fish and Wildlife. So she worked for the Alberta government. Nice. So Doing she, what? She was like the receptionist uh-huh. um, at, at the Fish and Wildlife office. Were they college-educated folks? Were they? No, so I'm the first person in my entire family, I think, in any branch to get a college degree. Nice, man. Yeah. High five. <laughs> so that, that, helped, that helped, <laughs> helped open up opportunities. That was my mom who pushed me to go. Because really? she had gone she... to college and had to drop out because her family, I think her dad had a business. Were they oh, from I Fox went bankrupt. Yeah. Wow, so you were second generation Fox Creek at least. Yeah, Fox Creek turns fifty this year, 50. so it's only fifty years old, um, and I'm turning wow, thirty nine. So yeah, my mom was like first generation Fox Dang. Creek. Dang, <laughs> the founders. Yeah. <laughs> so so you went to University of Alberta in Edmonton. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I, I like Edmonton. You know, I I think I told you I my father's side of the family is vastly Canadian, right? So. Yeah. We moved to Canada when I was seven, and I was there till about nine. We lived in Lethbridge, Alberta. Yeah, it's not that far from. Uh, not Edmonton. that far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we go up there every now and then. Go to Calgary more often. Yeah, Calgary's close. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I went to lived in Edmonton for five years. Um, so I'm like a diehard Edmonton Oilers fan. Oh yeah, yeah. We were too. Yeah. Although we had our Lethbridge team as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I started playing hockey, uh, you know, right away. <laughs> Same here. When I, was a kid. I remember just playing goalie because I couldn't skate. Oh, I was a goalie too. Yeah, oh, because man. I couldn't skate. Because I couldn't <laughs> skate, and my parents had got me these ice skates that were too small. And I just my my dominant memory of hockey in Canada is just like frozen toes <laughs> crunched up against the metal of the ice skates and just torture. Mine was um, as I got up and I became a better goalie. I played for the men's team, and I was like the underage player, and I got a hockey puck a slap shot so hard in my face in the mask that shattered my teeth in the oh middle of a hockey God, game it shattered your teeth yeah so these teeth were like it, it was in some random small town in rural Alberta. you were traveling around we had to like call the, the dentist the in or the 18 it was like yeah it was like traveling in the middle of the night like a friday night to call the dentist to come into like his office and like give me some uh gas and uh <laughs> like an impromptu root canal in the middle of the night that's i'm gonna go ahead and nominate that for canadian story of the year <laughs> yeah. that's a very canadian story You're if only canadian the only thing you to make it teeth. more canadian is that you lost your teeth because a moose oh, kicked you okay let me mouth. tell you my moose story you have a moose story okay for, here goes first first year of college <laughs> that i was almost killed by a moose you were yeah they're mean motherfuckers they're mean and big yeah um so i was i was my first year of college and i 
I had, my girlfriend was in grade 12, so she was one year younger than me. So I was coming back to Fox Creek to hang out with my girlfriend on the weekend. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was in the passenger <laughs> side of the front front seat of the car. My friend Terrell was driving. Yeah. And I'm sitting in the front. I'm reading an Archie comic, because that's what I read okay. back then. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she kind of gasps. I look up. There's this moose walking across the road. Uh-huh. And we were going too fast. So you're going to hit we the We hit it head on. Oh, my God. And the problem with hitting a what moose. What kind of car were you driving? Just a small little white car. A little white car? Yeah, it was total. Like, it's, it's a right What kind of car is a white? Like, what, what uh, I don't it, know. Like a what Datsun it was. or something? Like a Datsun or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> the, and no people who <laughs> haven't lived around moose don't know this. If you hit a deer, <laughs> almost every car will is high enough it will hit the deer in the body. Yeah, so I've the, hit a deer before. Yeah, so you hit a deer and it, it goes down. a lot down. of damage. It does damage to the car, but it will never almost go into right, the windshield. Right. A moose is so tall that what happens when you hit it is you take out the legs and its huge body collapses on the hood of the yeah, car. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. And that's... so I know people who've been like scalped because it came down, the moose came down and like cut off the top of their head and, oh my God. and crazy things. So it came down, it smashed on the windshield and I ducked, but I had a huge cut all the way down the side of my face, down to my neck. Um, and I was like this close, I'm probably inches away from getting like decapitated. Yeah. Artery or something. Yeah, or getting my neck cut off. So um, I, I was fine. Don't I, go to Canada, folks. Yeah. That's the rule. Yeah, that's... Don't uh, go to Canada unless you're there with body armor. <laughs> yeah. Because the moose will get you. <laughs> yeah. So that was my moose, my moose story. <laughs> It's a good story. Yeah, it's like, and it's true. When you almost die, everything slows down. It's really true. Yeah, yeah. So that stuff, that's no fun. So you go to University of Alberta. What are you, what are you getting your degree in psychology? Um, I, so I have this story where I went to be a criminology major. So I had to start in psychology. You're gonna, you're gonna get, because you're gonna start cops. Well, in I, what I wanted, Fox to, Creek. what I wanted to do was be a probation officer, in Northern Alberta. I was hoping I go get my degree, come back to Grand Prairie That's or nice. somewhere, Northern Alberta, That's be a pro-social kind of thing to do. It was because I was hooked on all those shows like X Files and Science of the Lambs, <laughs> and so I thought <laughs> so you want to be a probation officer. Yeah, or well, it was like I wasn't ambitious enough yet to okay. go for a forensic yeah. psychologist. Yeah. So I applied to the. Pro- to transfer the forensic or the um, criminology program two years in a row, and I didn't get in. You didn't? I got rejected both my first two years of Why? college. You were a shitty student. I was a mediocre student. Uh-huh. I was like above average, but not great. Okay. Um, and I didn't have enough uh, experience. Yeah. Um, other students like volunteered at police off- offices and stuff. And so it was really a story of failure that landed me <laughs> in <here>. psychology. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I. I, and it also, that's just the way it goes. I was also, a th- no one in my family had graduated college or university. Right. So it wasn't until my third year, I ended up doing this internship at this long-term care, care center. That, And I was on the research side with doing research on Alzheimer's. in At University of Alberta? In Edmonton, at University uh-huh. of Alberta. So I took a year off college. I had this internship program. You could get research experience or practical experience. I wanted to work again, like in a hospital doing research, like with, uh, you know, forensic psychology type of stuff and I applied for those jobs and did interviews and didn't get it and I applied for a job at a probation office that I was volunteering at and didn't get it so I ended up getting this Alzheimer's research job and that was when I got introduced to research Uh and that was my third year of college and I will say before then I didn't know that where research came from I literally how does research happen I would just read a textbook and it's all these things people know smart people know yeah working their white plastic machines somewhere and I hadn't it had never I had never questioned it I had never asked yeah where is this research coming from I didn't I was at one of the biggest research universities in Canada I had no idea that the my professors who were teaching me did research I thought they taught Yeah, created original knowledge yeah that's that's pretty exciting and it wasn't until I did that internship I started to learn what a PhD was and what, how, where, how research happens. And then I went back and I... Did you learn about tenure? Um, no, no, I didn't know about tenure yet. It took me about two more years. I remember when I learned about tenure, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> are you kidding me? Are you shitting me? Yeah. I, have, um, I have a great story. I was on the phone with one of my best friends from high school. And um, he's a police officer in uh-huh. Edmonton, Edmonton City Police. And I was telling him about my sabbatical. So I've, I'm on sabbatical right now. I just got tenure. I'm at a private research institute, the Russell Sage Foundation. Right. And every yeah. day I have to take the subway in and I have to check in. They do attendance. I have to be there <laughs> 75% of the days of yeah. the year. They're going to like dock my 
they're covering part of my pay. So right, good. good. But all you have to good. do is go Keep in, in line. and have lunch. That's the requirement. You go yeah. in, you have <laughs> lunch, and they serve you. They have on staff chefs. This is, I did something like this in the Netherlands. Okay. Same kind of thing. They took attendance. Yeah, they, they take the attendance because they're paying part of your salary. But yeah. you don't have to do anything. You just have to go hang out and be part of the intellectual that environment. That sounds good. And so this sounds awesome, right? But I was whining about it because. As you know, I have a five-minute walk to work. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly it's a half hour there, half hour back. Yeah, and so yeah, I was yeah. kind of complaining to my friend. I got to go in. I got to take a half hour subway, have lunch, and then I can come home. <laughs> and he's ta- and he look and he looks. I'm on Skype with him, and he looks at me like I'm crazy. He's like, "So you're telling me that someone's paying your salary for you to come in for them to have chefs make you lunch and then you go home?" Yeah. And he was like. I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah, he's like, why are you? Yeah, he's like, I'm going <laughs> to kick your fucking ass. Why are you complaining about this? And I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I have yeah, no I'm not, right. Yeah, I'm doing nothing for all the people in my family that think that I have the yeah. cushiest job in the world right yeah. now. Yeah, so so um, that's the tenure thing. Yeah, but it, I have to say, it, as you know, it's like you're still swamped with reviews and papers and you mentoring know, and lab it's meetings. It's true. And in the assistant professor years, it's no it's no cakewalk. <laughs> yeah. So so what when do you go to grad school? So I took a year off and this was kind of a turning point for me. The year after I graduated, I worked for a, a nonprofit against racism. Uh-huh. And so we did research on racism in the education system and I'd had to go to high schools and we had to give talks to like grade 10, grade 11 kids about prejudice, racism, sexism. We did like skits and and then had conversations. And it was fun, but it was also uh, deeply disheartening because you hear these kids and how racist they were. Oh, yeah. And the ideas they had gotten from their parents and these things. That's no good. And then that's what hooked me, I think, and really made it clear to me I needed to study groups and prejudice. Yeah, you really have, too. Yeah. You really, I mean, that's like right in your wheelhouse. I'm still at it. Yeah. Um, so that was the turning point. So I worked also for government that year on the research end, but it wasn't doing research I was passionate about. And so I got to the University of Toronto, and I worked with Ken Dion. And he was a kind of a senior intergroup relations yeah. uh, faculty member. He was about 60. And uh, we hit it off. He was a fantastic mentor. And then after I my, defended my thesis, I met with him to design a follow-up study, like 4 p.m. We settled on the materials. And then he went home and had a heart attack like an hour after I saw him. Oh, shit. Yeah. And died. Oh, no. I'm died. Really sorry to hear that. Oh, it was, it was uh, I mean, it was awful. It was, um, I mean, I, I, and I was basically effectively kind of like orphaned. And then I ended up being... Uh, lucky professionally because Will Cunningham, Will Cunningham, he had just arrived. Yeah. And he... I love that guy. Yeah. And Man. I, I met him on his first day as a faculty member. Yeah. he I knew he was coming because we had hired him and he took a year, leave a, like time to finish his postdoc before he came. And so bef- months before he came, I had emailed him and said, I'd love to do my outside project with you. Uh-huh. And so literally the first day that he arrived was July 1st. It was like a holiday. Uh-huh. And he wanted to meet on day one because he's Will. Yeah. And yeah, he didn't have yeah. a key to the office. It was a Saturday or something. The university was <laughs> you closed. you want to go for a walk? He wanted anything? to go for a walk and meet me for lunch. So I <laughs> yeah. met him at the department. He didn't have a key. <laughs> and he just said, let's go grab a bite. Because this is Will. He wanted to go walk yeah. around, get a bite. He had yeah. just moved in. He's a walker. And I had three ideas picked out that I was going to pitch him. So I wanted to do a project with him. And I thought, he's like, you know, Will has this pedigree. He's from Yale and yeah, all these I fancy know. places. I know. He's fancy. And I was like an Alberta boy, like these yeah. are like places in movies, right? Right. To me. And so I met him for lunch and I had these three ideas, A, B, and C, and I pitched him A and he loved it. And I was like, okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Um, and so I already was working with him and he offered me to join his lab and I became his first or second student, depending on how you slice it. And then a year later, he got an offer to go to Ohio State. So I moved with him to Ohio State. And I had a fellowship from the Canadian government that I could take. So I was still a Toronto student. Oh, that's good. And I could just hang out at Columbus. Oh, I see. And so you re- remained a student of the University of Toronto yeah. working out of Columbus. Yeah. So, that's so a I good spent deal. three years at Toronto and three and a half at, at Ohio State. So it was kind of like a really short PhD, yeah. a really long postdoc kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. And so I went there with them. And it, the fun story was that. Since I was still a Toronto student, I still had to do all my like my comprehensive exams, my dissertation proposal, my dissertation defense. And so the only time, and all my committee was Toronto faculty, other than Will, who retained just kind of a, an affiliation to mentor me. 
I had to meet my committee at SPSP each year at the conference in the conference hotel. So it's the only time we'd all get together in the same place. That's creative problem solving. So so I remember doing my uh, defense and I'm in the lobby of the hotel. And so there's all these other prominent people, famous people in my field surrounding me yeah. on couches, kind of just off us. And I'm getting grilled by my committee. And I remember they asked me a question about social identity theory. And right behind my advisor was Dominic Abrams, one of the top people. And she, one of my committee members said, what's, she said, what's the you know future of social identity work? Like ask, trying to right. probe how much I know, how... It's appropriate. The normal question. And I have to say, I know more about social identity than any of my committee members. That's like a softball At question. Yeah, At that yeah, time. Yeah. You're going to destroy So she's question. like, give me a softball question. And I was so anxious of misstating it and having Dominic Abrams overhear me and turn and say, no, that's not right. Then I froze. I panicked. Nice. <laughs> so I thought this is that would be devastating. Everybody's got to have a panic story. So I had this panic. Oh, shit. And I, Sorry, dude. The, the thing ended and I walked away and they came back. Well, wait, what did you do when you were panicking? I just, did you I, wet your pants? I or what did you, stumbled. I, I, did here's you what say I did. anything? We had tea set up. I had brought over tea for everybody uh-huh. from like the bar or whatever. And... Have you ever put lemon and milk in your tea at the yes. same time and it all curdles, right? Yeah. You're supposed to put lemon or milk in your tea. Right. I ended up putting both in my tea. And so I had this tea with all this curdled milk in it. <laughs> and I'm trying not to show that I'm anxious, so I'm drinking it. I'm <laughs> drinking this tea with this curdled milk and I'm sw- probably sweating and panicking. And I mumbled my way through it, trying not to say anything that would be seen as idiotic. And then I went away and they, they came back and they said, you nailed the whole thing, but you stumbled on what we thought was the easiest question. We don't, like, have you read that literature? And it, and then by then, Abrams was gone and I told them all what had happened because <laughs> they didn't know he was, right behind, he was in there right behind them. Oh, brother. Yeah, so. But you got your PhD? So I, I got my PhD. Uh, Successfully? Pa- passed it, yeah. Um, Did you get a job here right away? I got a job here right away. So I was really lucky that's how that's hard a that job market pretty is. Pretty good story. The the other thing about the job market was that I was on the job market the year that the economy crashed, and so I remember applying to jobs. It's my first year of my postdoc. I, I stayed at Ohio yeah. State, and um, I remember getting these emails from like I applied to Columbia, and it's like we've canceled our search. Uh-huh. You know, all these places started about a third of the jobs just got canceled because that was when the economy was just absolutely cratering. Yeah, right. And then I ended up getting this offer at NYU. And I remember th- being just so grateful that I got anything because, and then the the job market in our world was terrible for five years after. I know. And you had a backlog it's of just people brutal. with like three, four, five years of postdoctoral experience who would have got jobs in the previous years now competing against new graduate students. And so we're finally out of it. But I mean, I was lucky that I got it when I did. I and feel now, so grateful. And, and now here you are. You just got tenure. Yeah. So congratulations, man. And that's all downhill from here, man. Yeah, oh, that's right. Well, it's it's uh, it's all just you know putting your feet up, watching TV now, <laughs> drinking beer. Nothing nothing to it. And we had just some, eating some lunch, some beer last night. I can finally read the paper again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for talking to me, man. That was really fun. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks, okay. Jim. Okay, that's it. Thanks to Jay Van Bavel for an altogether enjoyable conversation. I hope you liked it as much as I did. Uh, You probably didn't, but that's only because it's hard to compete with me for how much I like things. You know what? If you liked what you heard, I'm going to go ahead and do something now that I've never done before, which is recommend that you follow Jay on Twitter. You can find him with the, uh, the Jay Van Bavel handle there, all one word. Or you can just, I don't know, just do a search for him. I don't know how to tell you how to find him, but uh, you'll find him if you want. I don't follow too many people on Twitter. As you heard just now, Twitter kind of freaks me out. But Jay does a nice job of uh, being relevant to a broad audience from working scientists to science journalists and even to the average. The uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I want to say right now. The average... Let's say the average Twitter user. Point is, you'll like it. I think uh, that will be particularly true if you're a young scholar, as Jay has been full of good mentoring of late on that platform. In any case, Jay, thanks, man. That was a lot of fun. 
and I hope it was at least fun enough for you to be willing to do it again. Folks, the music on Circle of Willis was written by Tom Stoffer and Gene Rooley and performed by their band, The New Drakes. For information on how to purchase their music, check the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com. Don't forget that Circle of Willis is brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia, and that Circle of Willis is a member of the TEJ FM network. You can find out more about that at teej.fm. If you like this podcast, give us a review at iTunes. Let us know how we're doing. It's easy, and we like it. Or send us an email by going to circleofwillispodcast.com and clicking on the contact tab. In any case, I'll see you at episode 13, where I talk with Nilanjana Dasgupta, professor of psychological and brain sciences at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. We talk about the conditions that affect the likelihood that women and minorities stick with or leave the STEM disciplines during college. It's important work, and I can't wait for you to hear about it. Until then, bye-bye. Bye-bye.